Those of you who have studied physics likely know about time dilation, or how when you travel faster, time will slow down in your reference frame. The formula for time dilation is the time you'd experience standing still multiplied by the square root of 1 minus your velocity divided by the speed of light squared. But why, in the grand scheme of the universe, does this happen? Well, we can start with the difference between speed and velocity, where your speed is how fast you're moving, while your velocity is how fast you're moving in a specific direction. So, say you're moving down a single x-axis. Your velocity will be the same as your speed, right? Well, not necessarily. Speed is always going to be a positive value, but velocity can be positive or negative depending on what direction you're moving in. So, in this scenario, the speed is equal to the absolute value of the velocity. Now, let's make our object move on a two-dimensional plane. Now we have to consider the velocity in both the x and y axis, and if the object is traveling at a set speed, the faster it goes on the x-axis, the slower it will go on the y-axis, and vice versa. So the formula for the velocity in the x and y directions is given by the equation the speed s squared equals the velocity in the x direction, or x prime squared, plus the velocity in the y direction, y prime squared. We can now add a third dimension, the z-axis, and the equation becomes this. But if you recall, Einstein's theory of relativity has time as the fourth dimension of space-time. So, we can compress all three dimensions of space to a single one, which we'll call s. If we plot space-time on a two-dimensional plane, we can put space on the side-to-side -side axis and time on the up-and-down axis. We're actually moving through the space-time continuum at the same rate, and the faster you move through one, the slower you'll move through the other. As such, you can view the way something goes through the space-time continuum the same way you can view an object moving at a constant speed on a two-dimensional plane, with varying velocities on the x and y axes. The greatest velocity which you can move through space is the speed of light, or c, and the fastest you can move through time is the time one experiences standing still, or t naught. Since the velocity that something travels through space can be measured relative to c, and the rate time passes in one's reference frame can be measured relative to t naught. We can just denote the speed we're going through the space-time continuum as 1. So, 1 will always be the hypotenuse of the speeds one goes through space and time. As such, we can apply the Pythagorean theorem and get 1 equals t prime over t naught squared plus v over c squared. If we solve for t prime, we get the equation for time dilation. This explains how photon clocks work. This is where a photon is bounced between two surfaces, with each bounce acting as a tick of a clock. Say you have four clocks, one stationary relative to you, one on a craft moving at half light speed, another moving at the square root of half light speed, and the last one moving at the square root of three divided by two light speed. From the standpoint of a stationary observer, the faster the craft is moving, the longer the ticks. This is because while all the photons will travel the same distance on the y-axis, the faster the craft, the further they will have to move on the x-axis. How far it will have to travel is equal to the distance between the reflectors divided by the square root of 1 minus the velocity squared over the speed of light squared. But since how much faster you go in space corresponds to how much slower you go in time in accordance with the Pythagorean theorem, the percent increase in the distance the photons traveled between each tick will also be the percent decrease in the rate time passes in the reference frame of someone on the craft. Hence, a person on board each craft would observe the same time passing between every photon bounce. So, if you go through space at the square root of one-half light speed, you'll effectively be going through space and time at the same rate. This is why, if you measure the distance to a nearby star system and launch a relativistic rocket at the square root of half light speed, the time passed in the traveler's reference frame will be equal to the distance measured from the reference frame of a stationary observer divided by the speed of light. All right, I would like to take this opportunity to address a comment on my Can You Go Faster Than Light video. 
Someone pointed out that from the reference frame of the Traveler, they didn't go light speed when traveling to a star system at the square root of half light speed, because while less time passed in their reference frame, length contraction would also decrease the apparent distance they traveled. However, I said from their perspective versus their reference frame that they went light speed. And this perspective was based on their alternating reference frames, where they first measured the distance before embarking on their journey, and then record how much time passed before they reached the star system. But I think that's a distinction I should have made clearer. Going back to the relativity plot, this is also why if you go faster than light, you'll also go backward in time, and causality gets violated. So, while things like relativity and quantum mechanics can be a bit hard to wrap your head around, there are a few occasions where there is a rather intuitive way to understand them, and I just want to make this video to elucidate that. Thanks.